You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks. So tell us all about Sustainable Gabriola. It's been an organization on the island for uh, just over a decade. Yeah. Um, you know, what's it all about and who's involved? So I can't tell you all about it. I don't know every facet of it, but as you said, it's been around for a dozen or so years. It's one of the most sort of ad hoc organizations on the island. It, we're not an official society. We don't have a bank account. We don't have an, an executive structure or anything like that. All of our meetings are uh, sort of, um, they're not, you know, we don't use Robert's rules. We just do things by consensus and there's no chair. It, well, each meeting has a facilitator, but that rotates. So it, it's a very loose organization. Um, there's, when we meet, we meet once a month, and there's usually maybe 12 or 14 people at the meetings, but it varies quite a lot. Um, and uh, we just talk about issues that are important to the sustainability, the environmental sustainability of Gabriola. Um, so all sorts of things, climate change, of course, uh, but uh, lots of other different aspects, food, housing, uh, health, transportation, all sorts of things. Did the organization decide to do it that way, to kind of have it be more of a collaborative type totally. of uh, Yeah, group? it was a very conscious decision to be a collaborative kind of group and not a, a highly organized group. Why was that so important to the group at that time? Or back That's then? a good question and I cannot answer it because I wasn't there right at the very start. Okay, so, that's, that's no problem. Yeah. So tell me about some of the initiatives that Sustainable Gabriola has been involved in over yeah. the last period of time. So a lot, lots of initiatives that are really important to this island. Um, for example, uh, Gurney Bus. Yeah, that was an initiative of Sustainable Gabriola. It, it took on a life of its own, as you can imagine. Uh, Why was that identified as an important issue in terms of sustainability? Um, because we know that we need to reduce the amount that people drive. It's critical to our efforts to reduce our climate impact. So that's how it started. Gertie, Gertie Bus was initially all about reducing GHG emissions, but it has become much more of a social thing. A social benefit to the community. A lot of people that don't have transportation didn't, now do, and and um, that is really important. We think. Yes, I mean public transit in cities like Vancouver. I mean they've been spending, you know, for the last many decades they've been spending a lot of money educating people about getting out of their car yeah. and getting into public transit. Yeah. And on the islands and on Gabriola is the same. It's more of a car culture here. Totally, uh, still. It totally is, yeah, and it's a hard thing to change, to get people out of their cars. Yeah, so, so. is that something that's on your, your focus, your agenda? It, it certainly is for Gertie. Yes. To, to uh, get people out of their cars and into public transit, it, and it's not easy, I can assure you. Because I'm, I'm on the board of the Gertie bus as well. Okay, so we can talk to you a little bit more about the Gertie bus, then, which yeah. I take every day. I'm a public transit user. Okay. I gave up my car in Vancouver seven nice. years ago yeah. so that I could help the climate and yeah. also take part in public transit, which I actually love. Okay. So tell me some more about Gertie in terms of what's coming down, uh, coming forward in the future. I know there's some initiatives on the way about electric yeah, vehicles. Yeah, totally. There is. A, you know, I, I, I can't even talk about it. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> We've applied for federal government funding to purchase two electric buses. Um, <laughs> the official announcement from the federal government has not yet been made, although it could be in the next week or two. So okay. uh, it's possible that this shouldn't be broadcast. <laughs> We're going to get you in trouble. You could get me in big trouble. Um, 
as soon as they make their announcement, then we can make an announcement. Okay. Yes, but well, the word is out there already on the I island. I understand that the word I've, is I've out there. I've heard that yeah. from so many people. Okay, so putting that aside, that concern, tell me about the electric buses and why you made yeah, that so uh, step. It's been a long-term goal of the Gertie bus to reduce emissions. That's part of our mandate. Uh, we started out using waste vegetable oil in the buses. Uh, found that as engine technologies changed, you couldn't use waste vegetable oil anymore. It just didn't work. So then we started making our own biodiesel out of waste vegetable oil and we used that and, and eventually that wasn't working very well in buses anymore. So for the last three or four years, we've been strictly diesel. Uh, and our goal has always been to go completely fossil fuel free. So we've always wanted to switch to electric. Um, and so now we are anticipating some grant money to do that. And our intention is within the next 12 months to have two brand new electric buses here. And, and uh, we, that it is a realizable goal. Right, and so. you know that there's been an impact from that initiative. You've experienced it, witnessed it, that there was an impact from that step, that action of creating the Gertie bus. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, it's tell been me, very, very positive in the community uh, for the most part. I mean, some people don't want their taxes going to public transit or anything public. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, generally, it has been positive. There was a, a referendum on on using property tax to fund the Gertie bus and that was approved where in other places, as you know, those kind of things have not been approved. Right. So that's been a big help. Um, unfortunately, we're not like other transit in British Columbia that gets get money from the Ministry of Transportation. A significant part of funding for BC transit operations is from, from the government in addition to their tax base. We don't get any of that. We, Why not? <sighs> Why are the Good islands question. outside of that? Well, it's not islands per se. It's that we're not seen as an official transit provider in the eyes of the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So we have asked specifically, can we be funded in the same way as BC Transit? And they have said no. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tell me some other initiatives that are on the agenda. I know you talked about the 12-12-12. Tell us about that. So yeah, that's an initiative of Sustainable Gabriola and it is to change the story around climate change and, and get people involved because we know there's a great deal of climate anxiety out there and that when you get people involved in something like that, it reduces the anxiety level in it. So that's one part of it, is to get people more engaged, but also, obviously, it is to make some real changes here that, that reduce our climate impact. So 12-12-12, it's 12 months, because it took place over 12 months, uh, 12 wicked climate problems, uh, and 12 locally d d derived solutions to those problems. That's what the 12s are all about. I see, okay. And, it, and the last month was August, so last month. Um, and now we're moving that into what we're calling Climate 12 Action. Um, and we're, we've created, or are creating, a number of action groups based on some of the 12 climate topics that are important and we're moving ahead with that okay. to start making some changes. Can you tell me about one or two of the actions or changes yeah, I, that are... Yeah, I certainly can, um, but I just wanted to say that the, they kind of fall into two categories. Um, one is actions that will reduce our climate impact, like driving less, having houses that are better insulated, more climate ready. So those are things that are going to change our impact. The other things are ad adaptations to climate change because it's happening, everybody knows that. So that could mean things like uh, people's 
health, uh, their, how they're feeling about climate change, so the health and wellness part of it, or water supply, because uh, water supply is a huge issue here and it's getting worse because of climate change, because of the way, well, heat for one thing, but also how the weather's changing a bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like you have in that plan, you're taking into account really the mental health of, of people yeah, as well. Yeah, that's critical. You're talking about anxiety, you're talking about health and well-being to make sure people are adapting. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about that. Have you noticed that going up this summer because of the wildfire season? or risk that's been going on and continues to go on across Canada and in BC? Yeah, I'm not going to say I've noticed um, something about people's attitudes or how they're feeling because it's not something we're measuring. Of course. Um, but I certainly know that people are talking about it and they are worried about it. And, and you know, it, it hasn't been so bad this summer here because it hasn't been particularly smoky. Right. We've had a few, few days, a week or so when it was visibly smoky here, but in other parts of British Columbia, oh, it, and that smoke, the pall of the fire smoke in the air and the fact you can't see the sky, and that has a significant impact on people. And we've seen that before here when, when there was a lot of smoke here and, and people were very anxious about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's one of the things that I've noticed that, you know, we can so easily slip into conversations that are ap apocalyptic yeah. right now. Um, yeah. And um, I was wondering what approach people are taking to that. And so it sounds like Sustainable Gabriola is including that as part of your plan. Definitely. It's, it, yeah, part of the plan. One of the, the big things that came out of the Climate 12, 12, 12 initiative was the importance of neighborhoods. Hmm. Um, and of people working with their neighbors, helping their neighbors, getting to know their neighbors. So in, as we move forward, that's going to be a big part of, of the initiative is to strengthen neighborhood cohesiveness uh, because it's really at the neighborhood level that we can um, reduce anxiety and make changes and get people to work work together. Why is that? Why when you take it down to that level do you think you can have more impact? <clears throat> Just experience, I mean when there's a crisis you turn to your immediate neighbors. Uh, I mean 15 years ago there was a massive snowfall and all this, there was a meter of snow on the ground and the streets were all blocked and, and people just went to make sure their neighbors were okay and they asked if they needed anything and they said can I help shovel your driveway and that sort of thing. So it's it's at the neighborhood level that we respond to those kind of crises. It's interesting because we just did a show this last week about uh, neighborhood emergency preparedness. Right. Um, the Wild Cherry neighborhood had a, a meeting and they had some authorities come in and speak to them, the fire yeah. smart coordinator yeah. and Shirley Nicholson, you know, the emergency yeah, yeah, yeah. preparedness uh, uh, person. And um, it was fascinating because what you have just said about the neighborhood thing, I feel like we saw in our coverage of that last week uh, because everybody that we interviewed, they were talking about that importance of getting to know the person next door or yeah. in your on your street yeah. and building relationships so that in an emergency you can help each other out. Yeah. Right. And it's really important. And on Gabriel, there are some neighborhoods, Wild Cherry might might be an example, that are are now well organized and have been for some time. And others that are not at all. And so we think it's important to enhance that. So you'll be trying to identify the neighborhoods that yeah, need that and yeah. reaching out to them or is that you perhaps know? not sure. Not sure of the plan. Not yet. sure where we're going. Okay, but, but that's the that goal. That is the goal. Okay. Part of the goal. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what else uh, in terms of initiatives going forward? What can we look forward to in the next year or so? from Sustainable Gabriel. What will you Whoa. guys be working on? So the, uh, some of the other things we've worked on, um, we've helped to create some new co-ops on Gabriola that didn't exist before. One of them is an energy co-op, uh, another is a, an investment co-op. Uh, we helped to get the Aggie co-op back 
uh, working as a co-op. The Aggie Co-op is one of the oldest co-ops in British Columbia. It's been here since the 1930s. Um, and it was all, had been for many decades a strong working co-op, but in the last uh, 20 years or so, it had kind of decayed a little bit in terms of its acting like a co-op. So uh, we helped to rejuvenate the Aggie Co-op as a co-op, and it's, it's nice to see it coming back in that way. Tell me some more about the Aggie Co-op. I'm new here, so I actually am not familiar with it. Okay, so it's it's a group of people. A lot of them are farmers um, that work together to uh, promote farming, uh, but they're the ones that operate the farmers market on Saturday, the farmers the evening farmers market on Wednesday, um, the food hub, which is where the food is available and is transported around the island to subscribers and and things like that. And they're also working now towards the establishment of a co-op store okay. um, so that there will be l access to local produce year-round. Um, and that part of what Aggie Co-op's doing in that regard is trying to enhance the production of food so that there will always be some food in the co-op store year-round. Right, so, right. Um, so getting some co-ops off the ground is really important. And, and I mentioned the energy co-op. Uh, so one thing, the energy co-op uh, is involved in the heat pump project. Um, tell me about I that. I can tell you about that. So heat pumps are an, a very efficient way of heating buildings. Um, because unlike an electric baseboard, which just generates heat by resistance, a heat pump takes the heat that's in the air and concentrates it and, and uses that to heat a room. And it's three to four times more efficient energy-wise to do it that way than, than with a baseboard or with some other method. Uh, and as you're probably aware, heat pumps are growing quickly. So the energy co-op, um, working with an organization called Island Futures, uh, I'm not sure, six or eight years ago now, uh, became the dealer for a particular brand of heat pumps and started providing them to Gabriolans at near to cost level. And um, now there are well over a thousand heat pumps installed in houses on Gabriola when you consider that there are probably only 3,000 houses uh, we're probably the heat pump capital of Canada <laughs> seriously um, that's there's, impressive really yeah a uh, thousand heat pumps on an island of 3,000 people yeah yeah or 3,000 homes I yeah, sorry yeah 4,000 yes. and some yes. something people but yeah it is impressive um, mm -hmm. So that's one thing the Energy Co-op does. We're also working on uh, increasing the installation of solar energy on Gabriola. Um, <clears throat> we have been part of the uh, use of waste vegetable oil, first in the Gertie buses. Right, uh, right. But now we're working on a project to take waste vegetable oil from restaurants, um, and there are several here, and using that to heat greenhouses um, so that we can enhance the year-round productivity of food. Mm. So that's a project that we're just getting going on lately. Well, that's very interesting because I wanted to ask you about food security. We do yeah, live on an yeah, island and yeah. of course it's always an issue for islands to be sustainable around food. How are we doing on Gabriola around that? Well, not great, <laughs> but there's potential to be great. Uh, Vancouver Island used to be food, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, self-sufficient right and probably so did Gabriel we were probably exporting food from Gabriola many decades ago but of course that's changed globalization and everything and now we're not food self-sufficient at all most of our food is coming from away um, so the 
goal is to increase our self-sufficiency in food for all sorts of reasons. A, it's better food. Uh, B, it's less transportation involved in that food. C, it's less reliance on other places that are growing food that are maybe not going to be able to grow food in the same way they have because of climate change, because of lack of water, because too much heat, what have you. So being more self-sufficient in food is good for us. And we, that's one of the things that uh, Sustainable Gabriel is working we're on. We're working on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In, in, along with the Aggie Co-op and others, um, yeah, trying to. Right. Enhance that. So, you know, we've been talking about sustainability and different things here yeah. all throughout the conversation. Yeah. Um, can you tell me, what do you mean when you say sustainability for Gabriel? Yeah, what's, what's, a, what's, what's fits into it's, your? It's a big word. <laughs> yeah, it is, right? <laughs> yeah, there are so many ways that we can be sustainable, economically, uh, socially, health-wise, food-wise, energy-wise. Um, we're kind of working in all of those areas, in one way or another. Uh, I think the main thing is t so that our footprint here on Gabriola is minimized so that we're not affecting the ecosystems any more than we have to. Um, that's hard to do, to, to do that. Um, and there's a lot of things that need to be done to make sure that we minimize it. And, and those are, that's, that's kind of what sustainable Gabriola wants to do is to reduce our impact on the land so that the natural ecosystem can thrive. Right. Even though there's 4,000 and change people living here. Uh, well, yeah. What's the impact been on you and the people who are involved with Sustainable Gabriola uh, of the wildfire season this summer? The extreme wildfires yeah, you know, that yeah. we've been seeing in La Hena and in Kelowna and Shushwap and, yeah. you know, and across Canada. So just wondering, you know, you, you live and breathe this, this, this sustainability values. Um, um, what's been going through your mind this last couple of months? It's, it's, it's scary. Um, just to look at the statistics on wildfires is pretty scary. And it's not just here, obviously, it's, it's everywhere. In, in many jurisdictions, if you look at a graph of wildfire incidents over the years, it's just going up and up and up and up. Right. Um, that's, that's scary for other climate change reasons because when forests burn, they emit tons of carbon dioxide. So that's adding to the climate change problem. But it's also becoming more and more difficult for forest ecosystems to regenerate because a, a, the forest here we have around us, you know, I look out the window there, you can't see it on the screen of course, but I can see dead cedars, a couple there, another one dying right there. Um, and our ecosystem is is changing. It's not the same ecosystem that, that thrived here 50 years ago. Um, and I'm not saying we're expecting a forest fire here, although it's quite possible. But in, in, in other places where forests have been burned significantly, it's very difficult for a, that forest to regenerate because the conditions now are quite different from when that forest started growing. Um, so the, an area that gets burnt will grow back but it'll be different and it may not be as healthy a forest that as it existed before a fire came. So that's, that's why the f significant increase in the incidence of forest fires is a great concern mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. and to sustainable Gabriel. I mean, it's been a really bad forest year in British Columbia, record-breaking by a long way. Um, but uh, as I was saying earlier, it hasn't been so bad here. Uh, oh, no forest 
fires on Gabriola. Knock on wood. <laughs> so far. <laughs> yes. And not that much smoke. Um, so I think Gabriolan's anxiety level about forest fires right now isn't as high as I've seen it before at during times when A, there's been a lot of smoke in the air and B, there actually have been some small outbreaks on the island. Right. We haven't seen that this year. Right. Um, the, the fire department works hard to make sure that we don't and, uh, and everybody needs to join that effort. So Stephen, tell me, why do you do this volunteer work with Sustainable Gabriola? Why are you so involved in this? Uh, yeah, it's one of the wonderful things about Gabriola is that there are opportunities to get involved and there's this ethos of being involved. Um, I like to be busy. <laughs> I, um, and so I like to just do things and, and uh, it, <clears throat> it feels good to be able to contribute to the community. So I like being able to do that. Um, but, so you, but you chose Sustainable Gabriola for uh, a reason. Well, you I'm, care about I'm, the planet, I care obviously. about the planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I also do quite a lot of uh, research and writing on climate change and I know how serious this problem is, climate change, and how much more serious it's going to get. So we need to do everything we can to limit climate change. Okay. Yeah. Any yeah. final thoughts? <laughs> uh, Anything you want to say to the community about? Yeah, get involved is what I would say. It's, it's important to be involved in your community and to, to feel like you're making a difference. I think that's, that's why I do it, because it feels good. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure.